Okay, now we're back to prophecy. So we're gonna be taking a look at a few of the prophets. We're mainly gonna be looking at Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Daniel. And um, in terms of what can help us the most uh, in this era of history, is definitely gonna be the book of Daniel. It just gives us more uh, detail and it actually gives us uh, so much foreshadowing for the future to come. Uh, and the book of Daniel answers prophecy for at least the next, I would say, 500 years. So the book of Daniel is definitely a book that um, I've looked at. Uh, I've, I've gone back and forth to it when I'm trying to figure certain things out. Uh, the best thing about Daniel is it's very, it's written with a lot of clues. So you don't have to do a lot of guessing in Daniel in terms of the prophecy. You can see the prophecy being played out because we have the benefit of past history to look at. So as opposed to when we think about prophecy, we think about being able to foresee the future. Well, the reason we know the prophecy of Daniel is true is because now with us being so far in the future, we can look at the past and we can look at the sequence of events that happened from the time Daniel prophesied till present day. And we can literally see a lot of the prophecies uh, in world history verbatim. Um, so we're going to be looking at that. And obviously, uh, in terms of the prophecies left by all of the great prophets, you're going to see things um, that tie into history, especially the history that we're going over now, which is the true history of what really happened over here. So um, there is no particular order, although there is some order to prophecy uh, you're going to find out that most of these prophets uh, were prophesying around the same time. And that is during Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, right when, um, right before they went into the 70 years of captivity before uh, going back to rebuild the temple. So, and this is, and what I'm doing now is basically taking prophecy notes and you'll notice here, I, I actually have some of the chapter and verses where you can go read. Uh, you can go read for a little more context. So what I'm going to do as well is I'm going to approach each prophet and we're going to talk about the prophecy and or um, some some of this isn't actually prophecy. Some of this um, um, is some sort of geographic detail um, that we get to include in our description of Egypt as well. So in some of these books you'll see certain definitive descriptions that you'll be like, hold on, geographically, that doesn't make sense if Egypt is what we think it is. Um, so what we're going to do now is I just want to show you, uh, if you go look um, just in the book of Ezekiel, if you look in the book of Jeremiah, and if you look at the book of Daniel, you're going to find out that uh, they were prophesying around the same time. Okay, so... Uh, just like Egyptian kings, some of these prophets ran contemporaneously. And the prophets were running also amongst uh, the history and chronicles as well. So uh, remember, this is a lot of these accounts are being told in a parallel nature. Um, and you compound that with the fact you can take like the book of Jasher. And it also parallels a lot of the stories that we're going over now. So um it gives us a lot of insight into what exactly happened 
the really tricky part is just trying to create a timeline to see what happened when and with who happened. Um, so, you know, scripture does give us clues uh, to give us some insight into what exactly is going on. Like you'll see in Ezekiel 1, it says it begins in the fifth year of Jehoiakim. Okay. So, and then we also know that at the beginning of Jeremiah, we know that Jeremiah's times also parallel with the times of Josiah and Jehoiakim. Okay. And we also know that this was also during the time that uh, Daniel prophesied as well, because he prophesied in the days of, I believe it's Jehoiakim as well. Yeah, which had to be because he prophesied in the days and Daniel prophesied in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, uh, which basically is during the same time as well. OK, so uh, we're just going to, you know, there's no particular order because uh, everything kind of runs contemporaneously. So we're just going to be looking at a lot of the points that were made here. So I want to go to Ezekiel 12. And um, I'm just going to read uh, a couple of lines into Ezekiel 12. I might read Ezekiel 12, 1 into 6. The word of the Lord also came unto me, saying, Son of man, thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see and see not. They have ears to hear and hear not, for they are a rebellious house. Continuing, Therefore thou, son of man, prepare thee stuff for removing and removed by day in their sight. And thou shalt remove from thy place to another place in their sight. It may be they will consider, though they are a rebellious house. Okay, I'm just going to stop there. The point that I was making here is what's going on here is the city is about to become desolate. And so um, Ezekiel is actually being instructed to take his treasures out of his house into another place. So I just wanted to make that point here that we can see that they are moved from my house to another place. Specifically, we were talking about the temple in Jerusalem and taking the vessels and or treasures out of the temple and putting them somewhere else. And maybe not the vessels, maybe just the tabernacle, uh, the place where the spirit dwells. Um, so in addition, even though the tabernacle is really like a portable, so whatever would be in the Holy of Holies, maybe it's not like the gold or something, but maybe it's something else. But whatever it was, whatever the place that the Most High and or the deity and or angel ascends or descends. So whatever place <clears throat> where it says my place to another place, we know that the place that as regarded as the house of God in the temple is going to be moved to another place. That is the instruction. And so then we're going to go over here to um, Ezekiel 20. And really, the reason I brought this up is when I was reading Ezekiel, um, and it actually mentions Egypt here, but it's kind of out of context because it is back referring to the Exodus, is what you're going to see a lot. Um, there's throughout scripture, there's going to be a lot of references to Exodus. I, you know, I'm the one who got you out of Egypt. And you'll actually see the phrase, of Egypt more than you will see Egypt stand alone. So when you're seeing Egypt in the Bible, you're probably 98.7% of the time it is of Egypt. Okay, so here it's saying, and to the glory of all lands out of Egypt. So if they were entering the glory of all lands and they left Egypt, what, what nation would that be on earth today? What, what continent would you consider the glory of all lands? Um, we sure we know the answer to that. Okay, so now I am going to go to the prophecy of Isaiah. There's a few things here, and um, it's really interesting. I mean, really, really compelling stuff once you start to put some of this with other information that we've learned. So we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 11 real quick. Pull it up. Okay. 
chapter 11. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Okay. Out of the stem of Jesse. All right. Verse 10, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Okay? There shall be a root which will stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek. And it shall come to pass that in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Okay, this is Jesse, the root of Jesse, an ensign to the Gentiles. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west, and they shall spoil them of the east together. And they shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. With his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river and shall smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shot. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria like it was to Israel in the day he came up out of the land of Egypt. Oh my gosh. Okay, we're going to stop there. There's so much there to discuss. For one, we see the root of Jesse being an ensign to the Gentiles. There's a few other things here that, I, you know, that, that include Egypt that we want to talk about. But one thing that I did see, it says, They shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west, and they shall spoil them of the east together. Okay? So there's a few things here. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. The tongue of the Egyptian sea. Is he talking about a language or the mouth? We can read even more if we're talking about smite it in these seven streams, okay? Which is one of my favorite things ever, okay? Why is it my favorite thing? Because if you go look at the Nile and or the Euphrates, they don't have seven streams. But there is a river that does have seven definitive streams. You can see them on the map. They're major rivers. One's the major river, and it's like the middle branch, and then there's one, then there's another, then there's another, and then there's another, and then there's another, and then there's another. So think about that. Smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shot. Sounds very interesting. Has anyone ever heard of the New Madrid fault line? The New Madrid fault line. Look it up. Make men go over dry shy. Smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shy. So there are a few, obviously there are a few things there, but the main thing I wanted to say was the root of Jesse and ensign for the Gentiles. All right. We see that. We see that written in Isaiah. We know who the Gentiles are. We know who their guy is.
and he's going to lay down the wicked. Okay, now, because in Isaiah and in and with prophecy, when the when the gloom and doom comes, there's always a reason. It's not like God is sending these nations to punish the children because they were because they weren't being wicked. It wasn't like the children of the lands were being punished for no reason. There was definitely method behind the madness. The burden of Egypt in Isaiah 19, it is a war of brother against brother. Okay. So once again, we see the root of Jesse and the Gentiles. Okay. Laying down the wicked, the burden of Egypt, the brothers warring against the brothers. Okay. So this is an Isaiah prophecy. So this Isaiah prophecy to me takes place a lot further in the future than do the Daniel prophecies and the, well, actually the Ezekiel prophecies also. We're not getting into, we're only getting into certain things about Egypt, but especially the Babylon prophecies, which, you know, we know for a fact that um, even like in the New Testament, when you're reading the book of Revelation, I mean, much of the information is already there in Ezekiel. Um, so these are things that once we start getting a, a, a more defined understanding of scripture, we can just breeze through. We can know what we're looking for. We can almost pick out the story just to see if something's right or not right or doesn't parallel just so we'll, it'll give us something else to pay attention to because uh, it's all about the truth. Now, really quickly, because I'm going to go to Jeremiah before I go to Daniel because Daniel's got the most prophecy information that uh, pertains to this point in history. But again, like I said, Jeremiah lived during the times of Josiah, Jehoiakim, okay? And he prophesied in the days of Josiah and Jehoiakim that the Pharaoh Ophrah, Pharaoh Ophrah, I believe is that's how you say it, will lose the kingdom, okay? He also prophesied during his life the 70-year captivity from 605 B.C. to 536 B.C., okay? Now, uh, during this time, we can see in Jeremiah 36, 12, we can see that Zedekiah was actually promoted by Nebuchadnezzar. Zedekiah was an evil king. He did evil and he made fun and mocked the prophets in addition to allowing the temple to be desecrated and burned. Zedekiah. Now we're going to go to Daniel. And there's a few things here. I'm going to see if I can find it. Uh, find the book of Daniel real quick. And we are in chapter. I'm going to start on one. Okay. Daniel chapter one, as it says. The, and this is in the first thing we know. It says the third year of the reign of Jehoi Jehoiakim. Okay. So we know that Daniel lived during the third year of Jehoiakim. We also know that Jeremiah lived Je during Jehoiakim, and we also know that Ezekiel lived during Jehoiakim. Um, so we can see here that um, in Daniel 1, he was one of the children of Judah who apparently was well-maintained, comely, and intelligent, all right? Um, and he was taken by the prince of the eunuchs. Now, this is one thing I don't know if it's clear on. Maybe somebody can help me out with this. Was Daniel himself a eunuch? I'm just curious, was Daniel a eunuch? Because I do know that he was taken by the prince of the eunuchs, but it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't describe his family, doesn't describe his children, um, but he prophesied. Uh, so just something I thought of, something I thought about, and it seems as though uh, if, if for some reason, if they didn't want us to think about it, they probably wouldn't have told us that the prince of the eunuchs was the one who actually took him and presented him before the king. So something to think about. So in the, we can already see that Daniel starts prophesizing for Nebuchadnezzar in the second chapter. So I'm going to go to the second chapter and I'm going to start from verse 30. And Daniel is trying to prophesize a dream for Nebuchadnezzar. If you don't know the story, Nebuchadnezzar is having dreams that bother him. And of course he sends to all the wise men and no one can interpret his dreams and here comes daniel after he decides to kill wise men okay um i think i don't i don't know if this is the one where he decides to kill it he may have just he may have just uh volunteered his vision on this one but there's definitely one where he 
nobody could interpret his dreams and he was going to kill everybody or kill all the wise men who couldn't interpret his dreams. Okay, so we said we're going to go from the second chapter. We're going to be in verse 30. But as for me, the secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than anything. But for their sakes, it shall make known the interpretation to the king and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Thou, O king, sawest, behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and in the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron, part of clay. Thou sawest, Till that stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broke into pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the heaven hath given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over all them. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, forasmuch as iron breaketh into pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh till, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet that were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So this is the first prophecy of Daniel. And I want to get back to 2 Daniel 43. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another even as iron is not mixed with clay. So I think that is a huge verse because he's talking about kingdoms and he's talking about a kingdom coming to take over Nebuchadnezzar, possibly take over himself, obviously, right? Because Nebuchadnezzar took the temple. So he's talking about a kingdom coming over to them, okay? And this is in the dream. And what does he say? Especially of the part of the miry clay and the iron. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another. So there's obviously a smartest beast in the field reference there. And you can kind of see where we're going with this. Because what they're doing is they're telling us the story, but they're leaving out specific details. Because if they left us, those details, we would know who the fuck those heathens were. Well, we do know who the heathens are. But, you know, it's not as obvious. Well, actually, it's still kind of obvious, but they're trying to make it less obvious. You get my point. 
All right. So a lot of the a lot of the details that are being hidden um, in identifying people and places, they're doing that to hide their identities. All right. So going skipping along and going ahead to a later part in Daniel, we're going to go to chapter 530. And this is where Belshazzar is slain. Now, this is not Bel Belshazzar as in the name that Nebuchadnezzar gave Daniel. OK, Belshazzar is Nebuchadnezzar's son. Belshazzar with a T is the name that Nebuchadnezzar gave Daniel. So we see here that Belshazzar is slain. He is particularly slain because uh, he, from what I remember, I believe he was uh, praising the vessels of gold and silver that they had taken from the temple. So basically he was, I don't know if he had set up some sort of, you know, worship. I'm sure they probably were already worshiping like, uh, you know, sun gods and moon gods of gold and silver. So apparently whatever he was doing, he was praising and or idolizing uh, the silver and or the metals of the kingdom. Whatever happened there, he ended up getting slain. Um, and it's really interesting because he gets slain and entered the, enter the same Darius of Medes. Okay. So uh, Darius of Medes takes over the kingdom um, at, I think, I think they said it was 32, if I'm not mistaken. Darius of Media takes the kingdom. Um, if you ask a classical historian, they'll tell you that there's no classical evidence that Darius of Medes ever existed. And I'm sure there's a reason behind them even saying that. Of course, there's a deceptive reason behind them saying that. I don't believe there's a legitimate reason behind them saying that there was no legitimate evidence that Darius of Medes ever existed because there we see it in the Old Testament. If there's evidence, there it goes. Written. So it was written, so it is. Okay? So he takes the kingdom after Belshazzar. All right? Now, what we're, we're, we can already see the prophecy of Daniel coming true within the next three or four chapters, okay? And um, he goes even further in Daniel 7 where he prophesizes about the four beasts who comes up from the sea, all right? So if you want to go to Daniel 7, you can read about the beasts who come out of the sea, all right? And then we're going to go to the next chapter, which is chapter 8, and this is the prophecy that includes Persia and Media being destroyed by the horned goat represented by Grecia, a.k.a. Alexander the Great. So this, uh, this prophecy is so specific because you don't really have to do too much guessing, okay? Um, even during the time, uh, it's like, it's almost like the book of Daniel is teaching us how to prophesy or interpretate meaning for certain things, if that makes sense. So I think pay attention to how things are said, because I think we're supposed to be learning something here. And we can see how Daniel is interpreting dreams because we, we get the raw, we get the raw dream and then we get the interpretation. So unless you know what Daniel's interpretation is afterwards, when you go into it, you know, really try to Really try to draw your own uh, conclusion as to what that dream is and then compare it to Daniel. Of course, you're not going to be able to do it. It's damn near impossible, but it's a pretty cool thing because then it gets you thinking on a certain level. And so when you're when you're reading prophecy, um, things that were once blurry all of a sudden become clear. So this right here is the prophecy of Greece and in another in another uh, way of explaining it, he basically breaks down the other prophecy. OK, so it, it gives you more insight to the first prophecy of the man of of gold and silver and iron and clay. And then you're actually getting the next part of that, which you got four beasts from the sea. OK, then you have the prophecy of Greece. OK. So you have horns, you have a horned goat, you have rams. These are all things that are being told through the visions. So at this point, Cyrus had been king for three years. Now, during this time, um, I believe it's in the book of Ezra. Also another 
This, these are things that you have to, you, you obviously have to read all the books. But in Ezra 6.15, it says that the temple was completed um, in the sixth year of Darius of Media. Okay, so once again, we can, there's another clue inside scripture that can give us um, a place to chronologically look to try to establish certain things. All right, so we know once he does that, he has prophesied about Alexander the Great. Huge. We know it. We know for a fact that the book of Daniel is a prophecy about Alexander the Great, but let's go even further. This is, the, the book of Daniel is, it is telling generations, okay? It is it's, it's telling hundreds of years of prophecy. So then we go to the 11th chapter of the book of Daniel speaks about the king of the south's daughter moving north, okay? So the king of the south's daughter moves north, all right? Now, as you read, the king of the south was doing this as a power play. He sent his daughter to the king of the north for marriage and a power play. So maybe he could come up on some of the king of the north's power. But ultimately, that backfired. Okay? Now, the thing about it is, this is actually, once again, this is a prophecy. The king of the south's daughter, in this, in this scenario, is Cleopatra. And what happened with Cleopatra is the main question. What happened in the history of Cleopatra? And we'll be talking about that next. So we got a we have a we have a dead ass prophecy here. The king of the south's daughter is going north, will but will not retain power. So the power play about the king of the south that sent his daughter north in order to in order to uh, marriage their way into some land and or power didn't work okay um and there's a whole story behind that that we'll get into that obviously what ends up ends up in what losing egypt obviously then we're going to go to eleven thirty. now i like this one let me go to chapter 11 verse 30 because this is one of the more clear things that i want you to read okay for the ships of team shall come against him therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. Wow. Okay. And we're going to go all the way down. But this is this is the story here. For the ships of Ch for the ships of Chatim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return, and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice. And they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by the flame, by captivity and by spoil, many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help, but they shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper until the indignation be accomplished. For that, 
that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in this, but in his estate, shall he honor the God of forces and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, hmm. whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hands also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Hmm. There's a lot there. He shall even return and have intelligence with him that forsake the holy covenant. He shall enter into the glorious land and many countries and shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand. Even Edom and Moab and the children of Ammon. So we know here we can literally see what's going on. But now that we have established the history, we know exactly who they're talking about. But now we're talking about after, right? We're talking about after the time of Nebuchadnezzar, all right? We're talking about after the time of Darius Medes of Persia, okay? We're talking about in the end. So it appears as though... There are obviously, we, we, we already know this if we've done any research of scripture history in the past, but we kind of already know there has been a conspiracy against the Holy Covenant. But in the book of Daniel, we can, it labels them. Edom, Moab, Ammon. Gives you a little more insight into what's going to happen. Egypt shall depart away. And 913, O Greece, sword of a mighty man. And the reason I put the mighty man in quotations is because when we think of mighty men or the context in which mighty men is used in scripture, we're often thinking about some sort of in-between man angel hybrid, uh, something similar to Nephilim of Genesis 6. These were the men of renown, mighty men, the sword of a mighty man. And we also know that that starts getting back into their mythology as well. So go ahead and take the notes. Go ahead and take the notes. Um, and we'll be at the next part we'll be on is going to be history. So we're still going to be closing up. The whole point now is that we're getting into Greece. So Greece is in the power now. And I've kind of gone over this lex lesson Um during the Holy High series. So if you saw the Holy High series, uh, I'm going to be going over similar material during a similar time frame. So you're essentially talking about from, let's just say, 250 BC, from the uh, beginning of the Septuagint 
uh, uh, Alexander the Great takes over approximately 332 BC. All right. So there's about 80 years in between that. And then we're going to be talking about uh, the, the world after Alexander. Okay. So go ahead and take these notes and uh, I'll be back. This is the final part of the history portion. So right now what we're doing is we're roughly taking, uh, obviously we've been going through this in chunks. So right now we're going to take from the death of Alexander the Great around 320 BC. We're going to go all the way up to 30 BC. And we're not going to really spend much time here. There's a couple of points that I want to make. Um, Alexander the Great went to the ends of the earth, at least according to the book of Maccabees. And I think this is important here, guys, because if Alexander the Great went to the ends of the earth, then the old model by which the map is being drawn, the Strabo, the Ptolemy map, the uh, Aristosthenes map, if if those, ma if, if, ugh. if Alexander the Great went to the ends of the earth, then the, those little bullshit maps that just show a circle around uh, the Middle East and North Africa and a little part of Asia and a little part of Europe, those maps are completely fraudulent. And that is very easily stated because we know for a fact, if we're to believe the Book of Maccabees, that Alexander the Great went to the ends of the earth. So... How could he go to the end of the earth if they haven't even discovered the other side of the Mediterranean? Um, and this is another hole in their theories. So Maccabees 1.9 says Alexander the Great went to the end of the earth. Then why the fuck is there only a little circle right there around the Middle East? So after the death of Alexander, they broke his, um, they broke his properties up and... The people who were controlling the Holy Land were the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, okay? So just keep that in mind. The Seleucids were an empire, and Antiochus was the leader of the Seleucid Empire, and then you had the Ptolemies, uh, who were the leaders of the Egyptian Empire. And you can see here that the Ptolemies are referred to as the kings of the south, and the Seleucids are referred to as kings of the north, Okay? So once again, we're starting, we're starting to get a little more clarity as we learn more about who, what, when, why, and how. So in addition to that, as we get ahead here, so around 320 after Alexander the Great died, then all of a sudden his, his companies, his generals take over control of his lands. The Holy Land is effectively controlled by the Ptolemies and Seleucids, all right? So we're going to jump ahead a little bit to about 137 B.C., and this is during the time of Antiochus. So um, for anyone who's read the book of Maccabees or knows the history um, of really the history uh, of the people at that time, uh, Antiochus is an adversarial figure, to say the least. OK, so Antiochus um, is the one who actually uh, sacrificed a pig on the altar. All right. 
um, which basically he just tainted the entire altar. As a matter of fact, they said that he um, actually drained pig's blood all over the temple. So he just he just completely abolished the temple, disrespected the temple. The temple is no longer good. All right. So and if you read Maccabees 1, 20 through 25, it should have some at least, uh, I guess, some story about exactly what happened. Um, it's been a minute since I've gone over specifics of that story. But, yeah, it's pretty crazy. And um, there's a few other stories within the Maccabees. Now, of course, when he does that, this this uh, kicks off the Maccabean Revolt. All right. So this kicks off the Maccabean Revolt. And that's what we have during this time. So we've got uh, we've got the Seleucid Empire basically ransacking the temple. And then we have the Maccabees and the Maccabees are essentially creating a whole army to, to fight off the Seleucid Empire. So there are great stories in the book of Maccabees. Take them for what they are. All right. So also around the same time, and you're going to see that Antiochus comes to power, uh, actually doesn't come to power, actually invades Egypt around 137 BC. Um, during the same time around, I would say, probably the, the mid-130s, um, we've got a philosopher slash cartographer named slash astronomer or whatever you want to call him. His name is Claudius Ptolemy, okay? Now, of course, he has the infamous last name because he is a Ptolemy. He is connected to the Ptolemies, all right? Claudius Ptolemy was a cartographer. He was commissioned with making world maps. It came out later, and if you guys have seen, is it the Holy Heist 2 or the Holy Heist 3? I talk about this quite a bit, all right? So um, if, you, if you haven't heard the video about Claudius Ptolemy, definitely check out the Holy Heist 2 or 3, um, and I talk about this in detail, to which Claudius Ptolemy was a complete fraud to the point where he even fabricated his, uh, I guess, his geo-coordinate locations. So after, I don't know, centuries and centuries, you know, these newer guys are able to use the benefit of technology to see if all of these old mathematicians and philosophers were actually on their shit. It turns out that Ptolemy was a fraud. As a matter of fact, it seemed as though that he back reversed his coordinates. So all of his mathematical coordinates fit correctly. So um, basically, uh, Beyond a shadow of a doubt, Ptolemy was a fraud. Now, in addition to Ptolemy pretty much defrauding the entire world of history, science, and geography, um, he actually uh, remapped the world in different coordinates. And this is where things that get tricky. So I forget if it's in the Almagus. Just go watch the video. So apparently there was a <clears throat> some sort of ledger with 8,000 cities, right? Well, he had one ledger with the correct coordinates of these 8,000 cities, and then he had another ledger with the mysterious, unreadable coordinate of these 8,000 cities, two which have all been proven to be fraudulent. The only problem is they can't figure out, they can't even figure out the cities behind the 8,000 coordinate ledger. So these are all things that have been put to light now. We can shed light on the fact that not only did Ptolemy defraud history for, I don't know, a few hundred years, we know for a fact that he's complicit in changing maps and coordinates, okay? And this person is a Ptolemy. So, what we have here is throughout all of this, throughout all of this, what happens is the Ptolemies and or Egypt start losing power. Throughout all of the invasions of the Assyrians, the Babylonians, they obviously lose power. So a Ptolemy power play was to send Cleopatra over to Rome to marry one of these Romans. Did not happen. Okay. So after the death of Cleopatra, she essentially loses Egypt to Rome. What was supposed to happen is they were supposed to have some sort of agreed upon marriage to where some lands and or power would be shared. And of course, we know what happened. Cleopatra ended up dead. Mark Antony killed himself. And Egypt falls to Rome. And Rome rules Egypt as a vassal subsidiary state. 
okay? It was part of a branch of Rome, okay? Part of a branch of Rome. The only major difference here between what we think and what we know is the fact that the lands of the north and the lands of the south have been bastardized in our understanding. I'll be explaining that more uh, on the next portion of this lecture, and this is where we're going to get into like all the good stuff, like all the artifacts, all the parallels. Right now, all we're doing is we're just taking uh, history and paralleling it with scripture, okay? Now, what we're going to be doing in the next portion of the video, we're going to be looking at things like artifacts, we're going to be looking at things like languages, we're going to be looking at all sorts of information that uh, pertains to Egypt being here in the Americas. So uh, we're going to have, uh, for lack of a better word, we're going to have mounds of proof and evidence. OK, we're going to be looking at we're going to be looking at the measurements of, of Giza. We're going to be looking at the Mayan culture. We're going to be looking at the mound builders. We're going to be looking at much of pre-Columbian history that has been pushed under the rug in classical academia. And then we're going to start putting a lot of that pre-Columbian history into context so we can understand what's really going on in the world. So uh, take these notes, all right? So right now, we've pretty much covered from the beginning of Egypt in Genesis, okay? We've covered from the beginning of Egypt of Genesis to the fall of Egypt to Rome. And understand that Egypt is still a vassal state of Rome. So no matter what happens, Egypt doesn't, cease to exist because somebody takes it over. It is just under someone else's power. So just like you'll always see these phrases unto this day, this is unto this day. America is Egypt unto this day. You're free. I'm free, hold dreams like a cold can of Guinness But old man winner got his own plans with us And you owe that nigga if you don't own your image Lone shot nigga, but a cold-blooded killer That, want your freedoms higher up on the shelf Every time you make a move that's detrimental to self And this ain't the type of debt that you can consolidate Small principles let interest rates dominate So when I did some shit that lowered my self-respect His goons cold and frigid always came to collect and when you can't pay up, they ain't breaking your arm They run up in your peace of mind, taking your calm So I concentrate like I'm making a bomb Cause one false move can take you from home And then you're not free So this concludes part one of America is Egypt I appreciate all the time that you spent with me I hope you've learned a lot I hope you've learned a little bit I also hope that if you guys have any knowledge to share for me, hit me up in the email, hit me up uh, in the comments, and I'll try my best to see what kind of uh, follow-up uh, information I can present for you guys in the next video. So this will be it for the uh, history part of America is Egypt, because now we're going to get into the nitty-gritty stuff, and this is cross, uh, we're basically going to be making a lot of cross parallels between what has happened in, I would say, the last two to 300 years that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that we're living in ancient Egypt. So it's going to be good because now we've talked about things that happened thousands to hundreds of years ago. Now we're just going to be talking about things that happened within not just our lifetime, but the lifetimes of your grandparents, your great, 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 great grandparents. So we can actually see where this information is leading us. And we already know where it's going. And that is to me, proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that Egypt is America or America is Egypt. And of course, you can already see that America is Egypt just based off the information um, that I've taught today, okay? And I haven't used the word America once, but if you know history, if you understand history, if you understand the migration of peoples and mythology, you can see exactly what's happening. All right, guys, I appreciate you spending your time with me. I will be making another video right after this. Uh, I'm probably going to take a day off, but right after this, I'll be making the video, the second part to the lecture, which is um, which is the cross paralysis, paralysis, the cross parallels between mathematics, 
history, the connections with geography, the connections through art. We're going to be making all of those connections. Um, so I just appreciate you guys sticking with me. Two paths to the chest, two fingers to the sky, all praise to the most high. Until next time, Shalom. I wanna be just the ends. I'd have made it back to Kansas with the help of the whiz. Dumb if you think love ain't the answer that cancels your cancer. While this fear is the anvil drop to make you scramble around in no direction. Sheep without a shepherd, run around scared, looking for protection from the wolf that's licking his chops, sitting on his hunches, hiding in the bushes, visualizing what his lunch is. Realize it's one sky that we united under when the wolf caught the bullet from the rifle of the hunter. Blast from the barrel, relief brain from its function. But my spirit's strong enough to walk away from it. The greatest trick they ever pulled was thinking that you gotta live by someone else's rules. And we believed it like fools. Step back, ask yourself if you're a tool. Getting used to build a library that ain't part of your school. If you do, take control back, make the mold crack. Think you tell out the trap and blast like nigga, whole lack. Cause you're free now. Even though this ain't a freestyle. Still free. How's it feel? How's it feel? You can do the same. You're free.